Hey guys, it's Caleb here with Better Wealth. A while ago, I had the honor of sitting down with Taylor Welch and just picking his brain as it relates to wealth, how he thinks about sales, how he thinks about money, where he thinks the world's going. And if you're interested in watching the full interview in its entirety, you can check out the description below. It's uh, one of the most watched interviews that we have on this YouTube channel. But what we also wanted to do as a team is just chop up a few nuggets as it relates to, man, this was a big takeaway from the, the Taylor interview. Um, because we know that in this world, not everyone wants to watch a full interview to get these nuggets. So without further ado, enjoy this repurposed clip from my interview with Taylor Welch. I realized that sales more than anything else, we're transitioning again in 2019, 2020, 2021, probably for the next 10 years into really a leadership based style of salesmanship where People know what they don't want and they might not even know what they do want, but they know what they don't want. And they're looking for leaders who can be honest with them. And you look at the news, what's wrong with America right now? People negativity. don't know who to believe. Yeah, yeah. It's negativity and it's conflicting points of views. And people at, at the end of the day, people get overwhelmed because they're like, I don't know who to listen to anymore. If you can learn to be that person that is trusted, then uh, it, it will do great power. But like, Spider-Man's dad said, with great power comes great responsibility. And so we teach our teams internally that first and foremost, the job of the sales professional is to help the prospects make the best decision for them in their life. Because everybody wants to move forward somewhere. You, me, anyone listening, there's some area of your life that you're not completely satisfied with and you want to move forward. And as a salesperson, your job is to partner with the prospect, partner with that person, figure out what it is that they want to move forward. And if you cannot help them move forward, you don't sell them. If you can, you, you proceed. But if you can't, you don't sell them. And this is like the ethos of our team is, is uh, to really master sales, you have to first master stewardship. Yeah. To master sales, you have to first master stewardship. And we're not even talking about financial stewardship. We're talking about influential stewardship. You have to learn how to be a good steward of your ability to communicate. A good steward of really a person's hopes and dreams and desires that they're sharing with you on the phone. Because I don't know about your team, but I know with our team, we have thousands of calls a day. And on those calls are not prospects. They're moms and dads, grandparents, kids, people who are struggling in this area or that area who are real human beings with real tangible and intangible goals. And it is a disgrace to leverage a person's problems against them. And so we don't, we just teach integrity. We just teach influential stewardship. You know, we partner with people to move them to the next level. And probably 80% of the time, bro, if you want, like this is honest behind the scenes, 80% of the time or more, we are telling someone, this is not the best thing for you right now. Let's put this on pause right now. I'm going to send you a book. Read the book. That's the next best step for you. And uh, because of that, you've seen the reputation of traffic and funnels in the industry. You're starting to see the reputation build up in Sales Mentor. And the reputation is just, dude, these guys do it right. And that's really what the definition of sales is to me is like, being able to steward the hopes and dreams of your market, partner with them and get them to the next level if you can do it. And you cannot sell to someone with a cookie cutter objective, a cookie cutter target. You have to understand precisely what it is that people don't like and precisely what it is that they do like. And that third phase is about understanding the target. What is it that you want? What's a perfect scenario? What would a win-win be in this scenario? in this area of your life. Explain that to me. Let's go into to your rules. And I, I watched one of your videos internally. You were talking to your team and you were just spitting fire and they were, it was kind of a and a session, but you started with like two big rules. And one of them is dig, uh, dig the tree deep, which yeah. I, I want you to talk a little about. And then it's the other one was make every, um, every dollar productive. Yeah. So I'll give you, let me, I've updated that training since then. Um, and so let me just give you, let me give you all three rules real fast is dig the tree deeper, uh, pay, pay for things indirectly and protect the assets. And so kind of making every dollar productive is, is similar to pay for things in, indirectly, but 
I realized when we started uh, purchasing real estate that every entrepreneur we've ever worked with kind of follows a pattern. They will come in, they'll start working with traffic and funnels or sales mentor. They'll go from a really low income to a really high income and their lifestyle will explode. And then 10 years later, they've become, you know, they've gotten everything they've ever wanted, but they still have to work. Yeah. They don't, their life has not become wealthier. It's just the tree's gotten taller, you know? And so I tell our sales teams all the time, I think that's probably the, the training I was teaching salespeople on that you saw. Uh, you need to be careful that you do not focus your attention on making the tree taller. Because what's happened in my life is in 2013, I made 30, 32, $35,000 a year. And today, I'm not even gonna tell you what we make next month. Next year, we'll do 70 million in sales. And the reality is if you look at my life, it, it has, it's changed marginally but dude, people cannot tell really the growth curve. Um, the tree's gotten deeper. It's not necessarily gotten taller. Our assets have ballooned, but I'm not spending everything that comes in. So the, the principle of dig the tree deeper is if you can limit your lifestyle expenditure while increasing your income, then what you get is you get something called surplus, which is a, a, a dirty word that most people don't have. You have the government surplus. sure doesn't know that word. <laughs> government doesn't know what that means. You, not a deficit, a surplus. And you can take that surplus and you can begin to put that into the grounds, into capital storage uh, mechanisms that will grow the money. And it doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't happen in a year. It doesn't happen in three years. But over five years, seven years, 10 years, I just sat down with one of our sales guys, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. This was actually about a month ago. And... The money he's making, I'm like, limit your expenses to what you're doing right now. Because he has all the surplus. And in the next eight years, you'll be pulling about $400,000 a year from your main job, $600,000 a year from passive income, and you'll have a net worth over eight figures. And he was like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. But the, the key linchpin is you cannot increase your lifestyle every year with the increased income. You have to, lock, at a certain point, the tree can't get taller than the roots or else it just capitulates. So the principle here is create surplus by locking your expenses and taking that surplus and putting it into safe, risk mitigated, we call it hedging, hedged assets that can grow with time and eventually create even more surplus. Then you just build a machine that's out of control. Like you can't spend all the money coming in and that's where you want to eventually end up. What do you think some of the big problems are? Because I think a lot of people's identity is just in the wrong things. And so we just have this whole world, especially in the entrepreneurship space, everyone's trying to like, like have this persona on who they are. Do you think that's the big problem or is there other problems that you identify and you're like, these are people that are making a lot of money that are broke? Yeah, I think definitely there's, a, there's identity issues for sure. Um, I also think that there's just like clarity issues. You know, people don't, you, people, who are you comparing yourself to? Uh, cause I'm comparing myself to Ray Dalio. So like, there's no internet marketer that I'm like, oh, they're beating me. I don't, I don't, who cares? Like Ray Dalio it runs $20 billion in assets and it's a different level of, of play, you know? So I think the mistake that entrepreneurs fall into is like, they just compare the height of the tree to everyone, but they are not actually looking at the root system. What supports this person? What supports this person's family? You know, like we have today, I have three different trusts, 14 or 15 different LLCs, um, maybe 30 to $40 million in assets that is spread around inside of this massive asset protection system. Bro, do you think I give a what some other inter internet marketing is do like? No. It just doesn't matter because to me, I'm like, dude, you've got people like uh, Dalio and, you know, you've got the, the super entrepreneurs, you've got Elon out there shaking stuff up, like get into another game. Like you're on the wrong fields. Like you're comparing yourselves to other players who are equally as dumb. 
start comparing yourself to people who actually understand the whole nature of the game. And I think that what happens is you become less obsessed with keeping up with this person or that person. And you become obsessed with the, the actual rules of the game, which is where I've gotten to. Um, I want to talk about this because a lot, of, a lot of people are changing their talking points right now when it comes to emergency funds. This is where we're, I mean, no one knows what's going on in our country right now, but, and that's a whole nother thing. We could have a whole episode on TNN, but, uh, oh, God. <laughs> but that I would lose a lot of people there. So I want to, I want, I want to be productive. Um, but what, when it comes to like COVID, a lot of people were over leveraged. They weren't, they weren't thinking about it the same way that you're thinking about it. I, I've been for a while saying I would have an emergency fund. I, I didn't articulate this like you do and I'm changing, but of a year. Now I know that you, you're, you do not say a year and you have a difference between cash on hand versus cash equivalents. I want to walk through that because I think, I think especially for entrepreneurs, it's super, super important. So how do you balance being like conservative and not leveraging everything, but then also being really smart with all the money that you have on in, in hand and making sure that it is productive? Yep. Uh, well, and I think it's also different if you're like a business owner or if it's like a personal, cause our, our, um, we do, we have a lot of cash on hand for the businesses because my employees want to get paid whether COVID's here or not. Yeah. So I'm like, well, we kind of need it. Uh, and I think that that's another big difference is what's your risk profile and where are you on that spectrum? Because some people are like, man, you know, I don't, I want to be able to like, if we're invaded, I have a bunker and like some people are that crazy for us. We think about it in terms of, what access to cash do we need? And does that have to be cash? Because there's a difference between cash and access. Uh, I would say most of your listeners probably don't have $100,000 cash buried in a hole in the backyard, hopefully. Well, that's truly an emergency fund. That's what an emergency fund would actually be. And uh, if you don't have that, then you're trusting in some sense on the current powers that be and the way the banking systems are set up. So really having a hundred thousand dollars in a bank of cash is the exact same of having a hundred thousand dollars in credit access with the same bank because they're going to decide whether they give you the money or not. And you may be like, Taylor, that's dumb. I've never, okay. Study history, please. Then come back to us because banks have in our American history, in American history, banks have run out of cash. They've lost your cash. And what the Federal Reserve did is when we went off the gold standard, um, there were rules that were in, this is actually before we came off the gold standard, this was like uh, the 20s, there were rules that limited how much a bank could loan in the, you know, the 10 to 1 thing. And then Bill Clinton undid that in 1999. So now they don't have those rules. Friends, we are in a dangerous position when the Federal Reserve and the banking systems that we have can loan 12 to one, 15 to one, 18 to one. And people are like, no, 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 it's 10 to one. No, 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 1999, we've reversed that. So my thinking is that you're already playing with risk, whether you want to or not. Yeah. If you have money in a bank, you are risking it. And I'm not saying you should pull it all out. I'm saying it's just to understand my thinking. I would rather have $100,000 invested in an asset and $100,000 in credit than to just have $100,000 cash. Because one is making the sum of money productive while still retaining the, the access. The other is just making the money unproductive. And that's a, that's a big distinction. We call them cash equivalents. So right now, I do not like having money in my bank account. I do not like it. It does not feel good to me. I have rewired everything about it. What I like is being able to see like, I have a HELOC on this house. I have credit card access here. I have a line of credit here. My ability to go out and get money is in the millions. My actual cash is probably like 20 grand or something stupid because all of my real cash is productive. It's in a fund, it's in real estate. It's somewhere being productive. And I think the, I don't like getting above 75% leverage so my LTV on everything is around 75%. And that's another topic. We can go into that if you want. But to me, get rid of cash, put that cash in an asset, but, but hang on to the access. You talk about risk and you, there's two types of risk. And it's interesting because the definition of risk is your chance of loss. 
And a lot of people, because in my book, I, I'm pretty hard on the stock market and index. And they're like, oh, Caleb, you're anti-risk. No, no, no. I own multiple businesses. You could, you could make the argument that I'm taking a whole lot more risk than you are in your 401k. But it's because I, I understand what you're talking about when you break down the two different types of risk. Can you do that for, for our audience? Ensemble risk is what most of the world focuses on. You know, this is your S&P 500, um, your average index, your average return on Wall Street. And ensemble risk basically means uh, it's the risk of the entire group over a set amount of time. So if you invest $100,000 and I invest $100,000 and someone else invests $100,000, total invested is $300,000. Let's say you double your money, I break even, and the other person loses everything then the multiple attached on that, let's just do the math, that would be a $100,000 gain, right? Uh, that would be what, 30%? Yeah, and then zero. <laughs> yeah, so they're gonna give you a multiple and it's gonna be a fake multiple. Like it's right. not gonna be real. It's great if you're Caleb, but it's bad if you're the person that invests and loses everything. And so when you look at the S&P, the, the, the thing that protects the S&P is they remove the, the losers. And so they're constantly rebalancing the, the S&P. It's still a fake multiple because you could be the person that invests everything over six months, you lose it and you pull it out. It doesn't, it doesn't do any good. Linear risk is the ability to actually control the odds. So if you invest into it, this is, this is why people are like, well, Warren Buffett's in the stock market. No, he's not in the stock market. He's not. He's buying the company. So he is, he is participating in linear risk, not ensemble risk. He's looking at the company, here's all of the odds of this company, and I'm going to actually inflict my choices on this company to produce a return.